All right, so let's get started. And welcome to our environmental statistics week, day three. And today we are very honored to have Professor Veronica Barocco as our invited speaker. Veronica was actually one of our co-leaders of our Integrated Health Sciences Corps at M. Lead before she left the University of Michigan. So we are all very excited to welcome Veronica home today. As most of us already know, Veronica is currently an Associate Professor of Statistics at the University of California, Irvine. And her research focuses on statistical models that extract information from the data collected over time and space. She has done many excellent research work on developing the statistical approaches that help identify the spatial and temporal scale of relevance for the effects of the built environment on health. So for example, she is exploring how the special distribution of fast food restaurants around schools affect the risk of obesity in school children. She is also working with researchers from the University of Michigan to develop approaches that leverage the social media to obtain specially detailed actionable measures for a neighborhood health behaviors. So I really look forward to your talk, Veronica. Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lou, and thank you to everybody at lead for inviting me. Uh, what I'm presenting today is actually a very much uh, University of Michigan-based research, since this is joint work with Brisa Sanchez, who also was at University of Michigan, and is now a Donsec professor at Drexel University, and Adam Peterson, who was uh, a student in the Department of Biostatistics at Michigan and just graduated and is now working at Google. Then the other collaborator on this project is a longtime collaborator of Brisa Sanchez, Emma sanchez Vasnau, who's at San Francisco State University. And really, I have to thank Brisa for uh, um, allowing me to participate in this, this different research direction for me, which is looking at how the built environment affects health. So for this um, audience, I definitely don't think I have to explain how the environment is affecting individual health besides individual level factors. And while we are typically very familiar with the physical environment, meaning water, air, um, air quality, temperature, et cetera, another aspect of the environment that is important and shapes uh, individual self is the built environment. And by built environment, we mean uh, what the US EPA defines as the man-made or modified structures that provide people with the living, working, and recreational space. One aspect that of um, um, where the built environment has been very much scrutinized as impacting individual health is in trying to see how the built environment is related to the obesity epidemic in children. And here, if you look at this uh, plot on the right, you see the increase in obesity in children from 1988 to recent year, where now we are have about 20% of children in the US who are classified as obese. And a lot of this course has been happening as for what could be the causes of obesity in children and why certainly food within the schools have been, have been um, identified as a potential contributor to the children's obesity. Much scrutiny has also been placed on the food environment around schools. And so, for example, there is an interest in trying to understand how sources of um, junk food are related to obesity. So the question then would be, if we want to look at what is the effect of the built environment on children obesity, how would we go about it? Uh, ideally, we want to write some form of model that relates the built environment feature to children obesity. And so if we're using uh, uh, GIS, Geographic Information System, and we want to relate an health outcome at a given location to a built environment feature, the typical approaches are to create a buffer around the location as and look how, man, how many of the features of interest fall within the buffer and are related to um, the health outcome. Another 
metric of exposure that is sometimes used is the distance to the closest wind environment feature. Um, and the third metric that is typically used is instead of basically a, risk, a rescale version of the first one, where we are looking at the density of built environment features within distance D from S. Here, it's important to notice that distance can be considered as not only Euclidean distance, but it could be distance in terms of time distance or like road distance. So it's necessarily not just the Euclidean distance. But um, so these are the typical approaches, but we believe that those metrics are actually um, might be prone to some limitations. And to illustrate that, consider the case where we're looking at the location of a school, here identified with a triangle, and we are considering a buffer around the schools of some given this length. So here, for example, I'm taking D equal to 0 0.5 in some coordinate system. And we have two situations, two schools that have the same number of features, the built environment features that fall within the buffer in both cases is 10. And in both cases, the closest built environment feature has a, the same distance to the school. But if you can imagine the um, temptation that a child that goes in school one is experiencing is different from the temptation of a child in school two, for which the built environment feature, in this case, convenience stores, are located much more, are distributed differently than for school one. And so we want to take into account of this behavior when we are developing our models that link the built environment features surrounding a school uh, to the obesity of children in the schools. And so what we want to do is we want to develop a model that allows us to relate the outcome to a, um, a metric of exposure to the built environment features. We want this metric of exposure to be easily interpretable and to be some summary of the spatial distribution of the built environment features around the location of interest. Also, we would like to be able to, to distinguish between the effect of the number of features and how these features are distributed over space. So proximity and quantity. And so what we propose is a model that look at the space in a continuous way and employs a two-stage approach. And why am I um, underlying the continuous way? Because if you think about it, you could try to basically characterize how the um, built environment feature are distributed around the school by creating little donuts, concentric rings, and count how many features fall in those rings. So similar to what many of you might be familiar with to the idea of the distributed lag model that is used for uh, air pollution over time by translating that idea to space. However, doing that means that we are discretizing the space. Here we want to use more of a continuous approach. And so I will present the model that we have de developed by looking at the particular application we, which we consider, which was the obesity in children that are enrolled in ninth grade in California and that um, for which we have obesity status as of 2010. And the built environment feature that we are considering is fast food restaurants. And so here you have a map that shows LA. Um, it's under all this myriad of dots, there is written Los Angeles. So there is a map that shows Los Angeles and then the, the schools that we have considered in our data set are indicated in blue and the fast food restaurants are indicated in yellow. Uh, and again, this is just a snippet of our data set that comprises the entire state of California. So what are some characteristics of our model? Um, it's specified within a Bayesian framework. And as I said, it's a two-stage model. So in the first stage, what we're doing is we are deriving this exposure metric that then we will put in the second stage. And so to try to come up with this um, exposure metric, let's think again about our data. We have as many as capital M schools. And for each of the schools, we are looking only at a one mile buffer. Also, one thing that I want to emphasize is that in um, performing our analysis, we have um, subsetted the initial list of schools to have schools such that their distance will always be 
greater than two miles. And we want that because we don't want these one mile buffers around the schools to overlap. Okay, so we took N's capital, at capital N schools, we look at the fast food restaurant that fall in the one mile buffer and then we reported for each school the distances at which we observe these uh, fast food restaurants. So for school one, there are six fast food restaurants within one mile, for school two, there are three and so forth. Now, if we take these numbers for the distances and we make a figure that shows on the horizontal axis, the distance at which you encounter a fast food restaurant, now what we have is we have basically a set of figures where the location of the dots is random and also the number of the dots, which means where you, the distance which you will see a fast food restaurant is random. So school one, where we had those six fast food restaurants at distance 0 0.05, 0 0.09, 0 0.15 are basically, which we translate into this picture, school two in this one, school n minus one in this one, school n in that one. So we have, if we think about this collection of pictures, we have n, different pictures of this line with a random number of dots and a random um, location for the dots. And that's what in spatial statistics we call a spatial point process. In, in this particular case, we have n different spatial point processes on the interval zero to one. And so we model, we use that as a base for our model. So for each school I, we take this set of uh, distances and we model these sets of distances as a Poisson process on the interval zero one where there is the intensity function is the parameter that basically gives us some information as for how likely it is that we're going to see a school or a dot in this line at a certain point at a certain uh, location so the intensity function for the Poisson process for the inhomogeneous Poisson process is basically <clears throat> communicating the, the likelihood to see an event at a given uh, location around this zero one interval. So we're gonna model each school to have its own intensity function. And then our goal is to take this intensity function and cluster them so that we can cluster the schools in different groups. And then we can use this group label as a regressor in our second stage health outcome model. Now, the question is, these are, these intensity functions are functions. So we want to cluster functions. That is not that easy. And so how can we do that? One trick that you, we can use is, because the intensity function have to be positive since they are expressing something like a likelihood, we can write this intensity function as the product of a positive numbers times a rescale version of the intensity function, which is rescale so that has integral equal to one. So now instead of working with the intensity function, we are working with a density because it integrates to one. So we're writing this intensity function as this positive number gamma i, which can be thought as the expected number of fast food restaurants that we expect to see in a buffer of radius one mile for school i times this density fi's and we want to cluster now clustering the intensity function lambda i is the same as clustering the density function fi so we want to cluster this fi so how can we do that statistically so one way to cluster observation in statistics is to use a mixture model um, then the basically the label of the mixture component to which the observation is assigned becomes the cluster. And this is what we call in statistics model-based clustering. So if we want to try to get an idea thoroughly of what this means is if you have data and you make a histogram of your data, you have, uh, you have something that looks like this, this, you can take this histogram. This histogram is basically an estimate of the underlying distribution of the data, which is this smooth line. As you can see, this seems to have be thing. If you look at it, you can think that it's the combination of three different densities, the ones that are shaded now in three different colors. And so we can write this density F as the combination of three different density, the one in red, the one in green, and the one in yellow. So this will be the different F. 
Each of them is characterized by different location, center of the distribution, and a different spread of the distribution. And then the WK, which are the mixture weights, tells which proportion of the data falls into the red density, which proportion of data falls in the green density, which proportion of the data falls in the yellow density. So these W, these different components are the different um, clusters for the data. And you can see the data here is represented by these tiny uh, segments. And so we have the observation that are attached to the red label are what we cluster in cluster one and similarly for the one in green and yellow. So, um, the question now would be, once you try to do clustering of the observation using a mixture model, is how do we determine K, the number of mixture components? So there are different ways to do this. We can fix K a priori and say, I'm expecting that there are three components. But otherwise, you can say that you don't know a priori what is the number of K, but you allow this number to be finite and just random. So that's one approach. The other approach is to say that K is infinite, and then you let the data tell you how many um, components, mixture components you have, and to which mixture component the data is assigned, or what, which certain probability. So that is the idea behind the Dirichlet process. So the Dirichlet process is a stochastic process, that can be thought as a way that whose realization, which realization are infinite mixture of of point masses where are centered around this point at a K that are coming from a distribution H, which is one of the two parameters of a Dirichlet process. So a Dirichlet process is characterized by two parameters, alpha and this distribution or base measure H. Alpha is controlling the, the weights of the mixture, while H is controlling the location of the theta K, which are also called the atom of these point masses that are used to um, in this infinite mixture. And to try to think about what I'm saying here in, in formulas, in uh, pictures, this is how a realization of a Dirichlet process looks like. The blue dots are the theta k, the atoms that are drawn from some distribution H. And this um, little segment represents this weight WK of the mixture. So this will be the proportion, the, pro the, the proportion of the data that gets assigned to this atom and this atom and so forth. So how do we create this atom in a Dirichlet process? They are treated according to what is called the stick breaking process. And it's called the stick breaking because it really, if you think about it, it's the same as taking a stick, making a first cut. The length of this first cut will be this first weight W1. Then you take the remainder of the stick that is left, you make a second cut. And then this, that, the weight W2 will be the product of this remainder times this piece that you have cut off. And you continue like this. So this is the way in the Dirichlet process, you create this weight of the mixture component WK and how you decide the um, location of this, uh, point, of this uh, point masses. So, it's clear that this Dirichlet process, because it's an infinite mixture, can be used to cluster observation. But in our case, we're interested in clustering normalized intensities. Or if you think about it, we are interested in normal in a clustering normalized then uh, clustering densities. So we can still use the idea of the Dirichlet process, but we have to extend it. And so the way to extend it is to use what is called the nested Dirichlet process, but before I get into that, I want to basically explain again what it is that we're trying to do on a conceptual level. So if we take the distances from all the schools in our data set and we plot at which distance they fall from zero to one mile, and then we basically take all these dots and try to describe what is the histogram of these dots, we would get something like this, which is the intensity function, which tells you that there is a high likelihood of observing fast food restaurants within 
for example, 0.1 mile of the school or between 0.25 and 0.75 mile of the school again, and then around one mile. So that's what the intensity function uh, in, uh, informs you. This will be the intensity function when you take all the fast food restaurants for all the schools. But we want to break down this as the combination of many different intensity functions that are representative for each cluster. So, for example, we could write this as the combination of two pieces, one that is shaped like that, and one that is shaped as in the second way, where there are two different mixture components. So all the schools that have this type of shape for the intensity function will belong to cluster one. All the schools that have this particular type of shape for the intensity function will belong to cluster two. Um, so this is how much I'm gonna say about the nested Dirichlet process. It's basically a process that we can use to cluster densities. And it's um, called the nested Dirichlet process is because it's constructed in the same way as we construct the Dirichlet process. It's just that what before were those theta k, those points where you had the little sticks coming out. Now there are themselves those theta k are themselves realization from another Dirichlet process. So having given you the idea of the approach that we want to use to cluster the, the school, the intensity function of the school, this is basically in um, uh, mathematical formulas what we do. We take each school, we take the set of all the fast food restaurants from school I that are within one mile radius, we model this set of distances as coming from a homogeneous Poisson process with an intensity function that is school specific. We write this intensity function as the product of a positive number that represents the expected number of fast food restaurants that are uh, falling in a one mile radius of school I times a normalized intensity function, which is a density. And then we cluster this density using the nested Dirichlet process, which is what these three lines are basically saying. So as a result of our um, nested Dirichlet process, we basically are able to assign each school a cluster label. However, it is important to see that the assignment of school to cluster, um, it's not deterministic. It is a probabilistic assignment. So we need to summarize what is the a possible cluster configuration of the schools. And there are different types of summaries that we can take. So in our case, we took what is called the mode cluster assignment, but then to account for uncertainty in the cluster assignment, we also looked at um, possible other um, cluster assignment that are likely. And we are taking this other cluster assignment using what is called a 95% credible goal. So uh, for those of you who are into Bayesian statistics, you can read this beautiful paper by Wade and Garaman in 2018 that basically discusses the difficulties of trying to come up with a cluster assignment from this um, digital process model and the difficulty in basically trying to represent the uncertainty in this cluster assignment. So we have four different cluster assignments of all the schools. And so because we want to come up with one assignment to use as indicator in our health outcome, what we decided to do is to avoid the potential um, misclassification of the school. We only looked at those schools that were consistently assigned to the same cluster when we're looking at all these four different cluster config configuration. This set of schools that are consistently assigned to the same cluster is called the consensus set. So we are going to perform the health outcome analysis only on the schools that are consistently clustered in the same cluster in the four different configuration. And then we are now linking the um, cluster label to the health outcome through a logistic regression model where we have multiple terms. So we are taking for each school that falls in this consensus set, um, set where for, we are writing a logistic regression where the outcome variable is the log odds of obesity for children in a school I. The first term is basically 
accounting for the effect of the number of fast food restaurants, since we believe that there is not a linear relationship between the quantity of fast food restaurants and the odds of obesity. We take, took the number of fast food restaurants and we created categorical variables. Um, and so we had a group for, we had one of these category was in the case a school had no fast food restaurant, one, two, three or four, four or five, or greater than five. So these are the different categories that we have. Then if a school had at least one fast food restaurant in a one mile radius, we then consider the effect of the spatial distribution of these uh, fast food restaurants by including the cluster indicator. And we had different cluster, each cluster had its own uh, um, effect. And then we had other school level covariates. So that was the model that we developed for the consensus. Then one thing that we noticed was that when we're doing this consensus approach, we are basically um, losing quite a bit of schools. In addition to that, even though this approach of doing the consensus was trying to account for uh, potential misclassification, it is still not really taking into account the fact that when we perform this first stage analysis, we don't have a deterministic assignment of school to cluster, but we have with a certain probability, this school is gonna to go to this cluster, with a certain probability, this school is gonna to go to this other cluster. So we want to account for that uncertainty in our health outcome model. So instead of using the um, a point estimate of the cluster assignment, we decided to create to look at another output that we can get and that we can create from our first stage model. And it is this matrix that tells you what is the probability that a given school belongs to the same cluster of another than another school. And so for each school, now we have a n-dimensional vector that tells what's the probability the school one is in the same cluster as school one, school two, school three, school n, where the com convention is that a school has probability one of being clustered with itself. So if we think about this, this is now a multivariate vector. And our idea was we have seen in environmental epidemiology another situation where each individual is assigned to just more than one exposure, but it can have multiple exposure. And so if you want to include the multiple exposure simultaneously in your model, um, there are different ways, there are different methods that you could use. One of these methods is the, uh, the Bayesian kernel machine regression, where you take your vector of multiple exposure and you map it to into a univariate quantity. And so that's exactly what we're doing here. We're basically taking the n-dimensional vector made of the probability that a school I is co-clustered with all the other school. And we map it to a number between uh, on the real line where this function H is modeled to um, have a Gaussian process prior. So basically we're really implementing the Bayesian kernel machine regression on the vector of co-clustering probability. And then once we have created this univariate measure, we can then link it to the health outcome through this Bayesian kernel machine regression model that we, we can now apply to all the schools because we don't have to subset the schools anymore. So our model that used this Bayesian kernel machine regression idea is again a logistic regression model where we have multiple terms. So this first term is again the intercept term for all the schools that have no fast food restaurants within a one mile radius. Then if a school had at least one fast food restaurant <coughs> in a one mile radius, there is a baseline um, intercept value alpha tilde, and then each school has its own deviation from the baseline value. So you can think of this as a school level random effect, which depends on the fast food restaurant exposure of school I that we basically learn about by looking at how a school is similar to other schools. And then we have like before this um, quantity that is basically looking at the effect of the number of fast food restaurants, where again, the number of fast food restaurants has been uh, transforming to a categorical variable. 
And then finally, we are accounting for the school level covariance. So let's look at the application of our, these models to data. We had access to data regarding the obesity status for over 400,000 children that were in ninth grade in California during an academic year 2010. They were, the children were attending over 1,100 high schools. Of these 1,100 high school, over 400, around 400 did not have a fast food restaurant within a one mile radius. Uh, 782 had. So these 782 schools are the schools that we are trying to cluster using the nested Dirichlet -like process using our first stage model. This is the result that that um, probability posterior probability of co-clustering that we get as a result of our first stage model. So what you see here is all the 782 schools that have at least one fast food restaurant in a one mile radius. They have been rearranged so that this plot can look much more easy to understand. And the color shade here indicates the probability of falling in the same cluster. So on the um, diagonal of this square, there is the probability the school is clustered with itself. So of course, we that would be just one. We have to make it in white so that you can see that that's diagonal. And then as any point in this plot is basically denoting the probability the school I is in the same cluster as school J. So the squares where there are represented in black, those are all the schools that have very high probability of being clustered together. So this would be our group. So we have group one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six identified groups and then there is about 300 to 400 schools that have very little probability of being co-clustered with, with other schools. And so those are the schools that you see here with light gray. So we identify six clusters and these are the intensity function that basically indicate how the fast food restaurants are distributed around the school. So we call school one, the cluster, cluster one, the cluster where the intensity function has a peak nearest to the school. The school will be located here at distance zero. So according to cluster one, there is a first group of fast food restaurants that are within 25.25 miles of the school. And then there is another um, a bunch of fast food restaurants that are between 0.25 and 0.75 miles from the school. Cluster six is the cluster of schools where the fast food restaurants are mostly located over 0.75 miles from the schools. We then took this cluster indicator and put it into as a regressor in our health outcome model. Before doing that, we looked at the clusters and we tried to understand whether we could see some differences between the clusters in terms of demographic characteristics of the census tracts where the, the schools were located. And we did see that there were some demographic characteristics that were associated with this cluster. So for example, the media income in the census tract where the school was located was different for cluster one and cluster two. Also the majority race of students that attend the school was different among clusters. So for example, cluster one had 44% of the school that were majority, that were attending majority by white students, where 38% were in, uh, attending majority by Latino students, where cluster six, those proportion were respectively 58 and 16%. So we see some differences in between the cluster in terms of uh, demographic characteristics. However, when we try to look in terms of urbanicity level and number of fast food restaurants, there were not much differences between the clusters. And then uh, in terms of how the spatial distribution of fast food restaurants is related to obesity, here we have a plot that tries to summarize the two models together. So what you see here in these horizontal lines that you see shown in different colors, that's the estimated age function that basically school level random effect for each school. The um, color indicates which cluster the school has been assigned to in, uh, um, when we use the class mode, mode assignment. The um, 
the triangles are showing basically the cluster effect according to the consensus GLM. And then the vertical dashed line is the overall proportion of students who are obese in the entire data set. So around 0.35 of the students are obese in our data set. And the dots represent the proportion of students that are obese in the school, so the, the just the sample proportion. So what we see is that basically there is quite a bit of agreement between the two models. In general, there is we don't see much difference between cluster one, two, three, four, and five in terms of obesity or the effect of the cluster on obesity. Um, for all of them, the <coughs> the estimated proportion of probability of obesity is around the same. However, what we see is that for most schools that are belong to cluster six, the probability of obesity is much lower. That is true according to both models. And what is cluster six? Cluster six, if you remember, is the cluster where the schools were characterized by the fact that the fast food restaurants were farther away from the school. So this is what we would expect. And so what we saw is that these two different approaches to um, account for uncertainty in the cluster assignment were basically giving the same results. We saw a monotone decrease in the probability of obesity as the distance to the fast food restaurants increased after we have adjusted for the number of fast food restaurants in a one mile radius. From our model, we can actually also estimate what is the marginal effect of the number of fast food restaurants on, the, on obesity. And what we saw is that basically there is a negligible effect of the total number of fast food restaurants once you have taken into account the distribution of the fast food restaurants and the other school level covariates. And so in summary, what we did is we came up with two different ways to try to assess the effect of the built environment feature, in this case, fast food restaurants on a health outcome. In our case, it was obesity. By trying to create a regressor, there was a summary of the spatial distribution of the fast food restaurants around the school. We then looked at two different ways to account for the uncertainty that is associated with performing clustering. And in one case, we reduced the number of schools to only take those schools that were consistently clustered across the different possibilities. This is, has, um, while it can reduce the misclassification error, it also is open to selection bias. And so there is this uh, potential limitation of the consensus GLM. On the other side, the Bayesian kernel machine regression uh, uses all the school, we are basically including a random effect for the individual school in the health outcome model. So we can make statements at the individual school level, and that could be very useful to identify schools that need intervention. However, it's not that immediate how to interpret the output of this patient kernel machine regression model. And so our future work would be to uh, look at how to include multiple types of built environment features and address some other challenges, like, for example, not wanting to subset the set of schools so that they don't, um, the one my radius to, do not overlap. And I think that is, yep, that is the conclusion of my talk. Thank you, Veronica, for the very clear and excellent presentation. Oh, sorry, I need to stop sharing. Should I keep on sharing the screens? Um, yeah, as you're, yeah, I, I think it is always okay. Um, so, Veronica, I have a question, actually. Maybe I have missed that. So, when you, um, at the beginning, when, when you introduced the, the summation with a different mixture of the distribution, and then the number of the um, mixture types like a K. So is that is that also um, could that also be random or yeah yeah. So if you are using a so you can create a, a finite mixture model right. in different ways. So if you are using a frequentist approach, typically you choose the number of mixture component by some criteria, maybe BIC or things like that, or some other summary of model fit. 
If you are adopting a Bayesian approach, you could also put a prior on the number of mixture components and then basically um, fit your model where there is also this additional random variable. Sometimes model fitting for this type of model is not that simple because the sampling algorithm is kind of complicated, mm -hmm. um, which I think is also one reason why people like to take the other approach of having K go to infinity, because I think in my own experience, fitting a judicial process model is actually, mixture model is somewhat easier than doing something like reversible jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I think especially like your work all based on the Bayesian approaches and then you could put K as one of the variable and then actually you estimate that, give it a prior and then uh, estimate the K, then that could be data driven as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So another related question is later on when you show the application, um, you show the number of clusters six. And I, I think, feel like, you know, for in terms of the relationship of obesity versus the environment, uh, for number one to five, they actually are very close. Uh, yeah. Actually, next, next slide. <clears throat> The results, yeah. Yeah, 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 this one. So I wonder maybe, you know, we could borrow, you know, the kind of information later or join the modeling approach. We do not necessarily to have so many clusters. Yes, like, that's definitely true. You could, so we are doing these two stage approaches. You could do a one stage, you could do a, um, a complete, um, just one join model where you do the clustering and the fitting of the health outcome together. Right. And, um, or you can also change your prior on the number of components and try choose a prior that has less cluster, mm -hmm. favors having less cluster more than a lot of clusters. We didn't, besides the fact that, I mean, fitting this model was uh, at the end complex because we had a lot of data points, um, we, I, there is always this, um, I think this question when you do these models where you are estimating the exposure and then putting the estimated exposure into a health outcome model. Um, some people are against the idea of a joint model of the exposure and the health at the same time because of the feedback between mm -hmm. the health outcome and the exposure and some, some people think you should keep them separate, some other are arguing for instead having just one joint model. So it's uh, it's always an open question. Okay. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Very interesting. I think the results looks very interesting. And also I really like your visual demonstration of the presentation that makes the story very clear to people. Thank you. Other questions from the audience, yeah, Marie? Yes, thank you, Veronica, for this presentation. Very interesting. I'm thinking about other kind of built or natural environment characteristics that we think about in environmental epidemiology. Uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering specifically, like thinking about green space and vegetation that, that's not built per se, but it is something that people have looked at. And at your last slide, I think you said you're planning to incorporate other features of built environment and use this kind mm -hmm. of modeling framework. And I wonder if you could just share what, what might those features be and whether there are some differences, um, you know, because yeah, obviously, so yeah. We haven't been talking, uh, this is again like work with Brisa, so these are our conversations. So we haven't been talking about including green space and uh, um, those variables. We, are still, we were still being discussing, uh, still linked to obesity, other types of stores, right? Right now we're looking at fast food restaurants, but you could have like bakeries, and you know what are called i think the convenience store so if you take these databases that have all the different um, businesses that are in different categories and so it can become very granular i think some of the things that you have to be careful when you have multiple uh, built environment features is that 
there might be some correlation between the built environment features and maybe not a positive one, right? There might be that they are competing against each other. And so, so that is one direction. Um, there are also other directions that we haven't you know, thought about here, but definitely um, I think right now we're just looking at the distance in one, in one dimension. And you know where actually the fast food restaurant is located is not coming into place, right? We we say we just think about um, if I go back to the figure, yeah. We just think about the distance, not that, but it's the same distance. The fast food restaurant can be here, can be here, can be here. It can be in a circle, and so maybe if there is no road to get to the fast food restaurants that easily that fast food restaurant is not that important. So there might be also other aspects of the built environment that should be considered as well. Yeah, thank you. I think the idea of its proximity and then accessibility because if people can't get there easily, right. it's an interesting, yeah, yeah. thank you. So also, Veronica. So when you, you know, maybe it's also the uh, the study design from the uh, scientific investigators. So when they set up as one mile, um, I know, like for example, in in another, I mean, comparing the the distance from the school to the fast food restaurant, typically is like further away from one mile. You know how you. Know, so we came up with one mile because, as I said, me and Brisa have been working on this problem for some time now. And initially, we tried to address this issue of basically the fact that just counting how many features there are in a buffer is not enough. You also need to understand how these features are distributed. And so what we did initially, as I said, is like we basically created donuts. So we, we took the biggest buffer radius that we could think of. And I think in the analysis that we initially did, we took seven miles. And then we did little buffers within these seven miles radius. And we counted how many stores were in each of these little buffer, these concentric rings. And then we use all these regressors, so number of fast food restaurants, in the little circle around the school, number of fast food restaurants in the little donut between a radius of 0.1 and 0.2, number of fast food restaurants between 0.2 and 0.3 miles, and so forth. So we had all these regressors that we put into the regression model in the same way as when you do an air pollution study, you have the health outcome and the air pollution on day one, day two, you know, the, the day before, the day before, before, two days, three days before, four days before. So we had this many regressors, and then we use this distributed lag approach mm -hmm. because the regressors potentially were um, correlated. And so we came up with this distributed lag model. And when we did this distributed lag model, we got our distributed lag function, and you could see that there was a strong effect when the fast food restaurants were, with the fast food restaurants that were very close to the school, and then the effect went down. And when you were at one mile, basically the lag function was close to zero. So that's how we came up with the, with the distance of one mile. Mm -hmm. So this work is just basically trying to get away from the idea of using the donut shape to something where you just look at the space without doing this discretization idea. Yeah. All right, so since we already passed 1250 and let's close this section. And if people still have questions, you can stay online. And thank you so much, Veronica, for this wonderful talk. And that's very- Thank you everybody for inviting me and for coming. It was good to see you remotely and I hope to see you in person soon. <laughs>